So there's another concept I want to get onto here called dysphoria. So dysphoria is sort of little known in evolutionary psychology, and it's based on the idea that unhappiness uh, and malaise essentially can stem from culture being mismatched onto a set of evolved predispositions. So modern environments, I argue, are highly dysphoric inducing because there are many evolutionarily novel features present to which we simply do not have adaptations. Uh, not to say we can't cope with those, we have executive functions, we have general intelligence, we have various mechanisms that allow us to deal with evolutionary novelty, but what we don't have is a sort of instinctual mechanism to cope with these non-recurrent problems which are a feature of modernity such as big cities with millions of people living close together. Um, so a good example I've, I've given here is wealth and inequality. Modern people in industrialized societies are very wealthy compared to their ancestors. Resources are not distributed equally. There exist surpluses. Um, and for many people, this state of affairs is simply unacceptable. Hence, they vote for, for egalitarian parties to try to essentially create more evolutionarily familiar levels of equality. Um, now, wealth has increased in Western nations massively since the Second World War as a result of deregulation primarily. This is what's called the post-war economic boom. And it's no coincidence, in my mind, and this is a connection that I've made in the literature, is that, uh, is that the 60s was characterized by radicalism, I believe, as a form of reactive egalitarianism to this evolutionarily unfamiliar increase in wealth and inequality that came about as a result of that wealth not being distributed equally. So essentially, the 60s led to a massive shift in the normative center of gravity, which Engelhardt uh, who's a sociologist who studied this transition, these transitional values, calls the silent revolution. Uh, and this has led to the sort of rise of big states, and, and it's led to a leftward shift in the normative center of gravity towards what's called post-materialism, which is characteristic pretty much of all the West. So attempts to cope with dysphoria don't necessarily have to uh, lead to mitigation of that dysphoria, they can actually potentiate it. And a good example would be, again, going back to communism, these people voted for communism because they saw the inequality and they wanted to rectify it, but the system they got potentiated the dysphoria because it led to an even more evolutionarily unfamiliar and mismatched set of circumstances. Um, so essentially, going back to what I mentioned, Inglehart, who's documented this transitional values, has shown that, I mean, the, these are basically the world culture values. What we have here are Protestant European nations, uh, which would include Britain, over in what's called the post-materialist wing, which is characterized by high self-expression, and also high secular rational values, so in other words, irreligious, um, sort of leftist. And here you have materialist cultures, who, um, where the emphasis is on survival rather than sort of self-actualization, and where there's a bigger emphasis on traditional values, so greater role played by religion. And of course the world didn't look like this 50 years ago. These countries would have been closer to the center, um, and there would have been a, you know, would have been a very different map. So this is cultural evolution occurring over the course of 60 years that's pushed these countries out towards the post-materialist wing of this, of this spectrum. So what I'm arguing is that this dysphoric dysrationalia, uh, which I've taken to calling it, is actually a source of existential risk. Um, so attempts to cope with dysphoria in the 60s, um, I believe essentially cultivate the modern clever silly, um, who despite being quite smart, tend to believe in irrational things, the New Age movement, hippieism, etc., free life, you know, and, and other things. Um, a good example of, of dysphoric dysrationalia in action, although it might not necessarily be an existential risk, although it's an annoyance to those of us who, who study human intelligence, is this wide-scale rejection of, 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 uh, of intelligence testing and IQ tests. Now, all they measure is individual differences in a latent psychometric dimension called G. Um, they have no more normative content than a ruler that's used to measure uh, the physical dimension of length. However, they are subject to a great deal of misunderstanding, and I believe this is partly because the human brain has evolved to basically rank individuals in a dominance hierarchy. And the IQ, the idea that people can be ranked on a dimension of G is, is normative. It translates into something normative that people just don't like. So as a consequence of that, uh, they reject it. It has a, what's called a yuck, what, what a, a bioethicists sometimes call a yuck factor. Um, and also, there's an expectation that these things are bad and wrong because of where the normative center of gravity is, um, because these things are believed to prop up sort of inequality or justify inequality. All hierarchies must be abolished. This was, you know, a, a cry of the radicals of the 60s. So essentially, anything that's hierarchical is to be abolished. 
And a good example of where this has been taken to an extreme, and where this might count as a source of existential risk, where it shades into genuine existential risk, is of course postmodernism, as a system that attempts to destroy all hierarchy, but attempts to label all science as normative. Um, as heterosexist, as racist, as, as misogynist, as whatever. So, in as, much as it, in as much as it can affect science as a whole, it can constitute a source of existential risk. Um, so, another good example of dysphoric dysrationality is political correctness. So, political correctness, I, I've, I've likened it to philanthropy. It's based on a very similar impulse, a sort of giving impulse, as a way of elevating your social status. But in the case of political correctness, it has drawbacks. Because it stifles scientific, well, you know, stifles scientific research into human behaviour that might come to an egalitarian conclusions on like sex differences and evolutionary psychology, and also it sort of has broader implications in terms of liberties and things in society. And the libertarians are very concerned about these sort of things um, and the effects it might have on research downstream. Um, and it's it's it, it's enforced by like quangos and taxpayers' expense. People aren't giving their own money to sort of PC causes. They're expecting other people to give their money to PC. So it's parasitic in that these people elevate their social status at the expense of, of, of you know other people who are made to foot the bill at the end of the day. So it transfers its costs onto other segments of society. So it's philanthropy gone bad. Um, and also economic mismanagement, which I believe is very much a, a problem. Um, I believe it's significantly associated with recessions and business cycles, and if there was less government involved in these things, we might have a we might have a, a, an economy which could more effectively manage itself. Um, but the desire to manage the economy comes from again this idea that we need to create more equality, we need to create these evolutionarily familiar circumstances, uh, which have now become a sort of normative imperative. Um, so. On a final note here, how clever cities will try to thwart the singularity? Well, I believe they will. I believe, I believe we're headed for rough times here as people interested in transhumanism and the singularity movement. I think that the takeoff period leading to the singularity, that's if it happens, and I know some of you here don't necessarily think it will, will lead to a widening of the rich poor divide. Let's say Aubrey de Grey's uh, SENS program takes off. For a while there, it will be the case that only the rich will be able to afford these drugs or these interventions or whatever. And as a consequence of that, it will potentiate the dysphoria because the inequality will increase. And I think this will create opportunities for legislators to legislate against transhumanism. I'm convinced that the word transhumanism in about 20 or 30 years will become synonymous with eugenics. We're already starting to see this with covers of major magazines claiming that uh, transhumanism is the worst threat to humanity. Um, and as a consequence of this, we're definitely seeing this vilification of transhumanism that will precede its outright sort of, uh, its outright, uh, what well, branding as a taboo. Um, so I expect transhumanism to become very, very unpopular in the future as a consequence, and I expect there to be active attempts by governments, uh, clever governments and clever cities, to basically stamp on it and crush it and stop it through legislation. So the question is, where do we go from here? That brings me to my final slide. Um, potential solutions. Well, I'm a little sceptical of dismiss, a little sceptical of, of what we might be able to do. But one possibility is that a rapid singularity might narrow the window of opportunity for these sort of upgrades that, that we're all hoping will come about in our lifetime. As a result of that, it will reduce the time period uh, that these things will only be available to the wealthy and will hopefully mitigate any problems as a consequence. But of course it carries a massive risk because, as Kurzweil points out, the, more, the quicker the uh, uh, takeoff period of the singularity, the more likely it's, it's to be the result of something like an anthropocidal AI or grey goo. So it's not necessarily human friendly. Another possibility is to establish sort of libertarian statelets where these technologies can flourish outside of the jurisdiction of larger statist, uh, statist governments. A drawback of this, of course, is that uh, these micro-nations would be difficult to defend against acts of aggression, and there would be acts of aggression against them, especially if you had a population of people whose life expectancy was a thousand and everyone else's was, you know, a hundred at best. Oh, that'd be aggression, like hell they would. Another solution might involve developing cognitive workarounds, so this is the whole less wrong type philosophy, which might permit people to use sort of one form of executive functioning, i.e. raw intelligence, to check their rationality and to avoid disrationality. In other words, you can train people to be more rational. The problem is that I don't, people are horrible self-deceivers. I don't think they'd be willing to use these workarounds even if they're available. Plus, we know too little about the executive processes involved 
to really put a number on whether these things would be uh, effective or not. So that's really all I wanted to say. Thank you very much for having me.